Well, this is Emilio Ramos, preaching pastor of Heritage Grace Community Church. We are so blessed that you've decided to join us, watch our sermons, and watch our content here at heritagegrace.com and on Facebook. Uh, just please remember, our sermons are here to bless you, but they are certainly not here to replace the preaching and the teaching from your local church. Uh, with that, if you've liked the, the material, the sermons, and the preaching here, be sure and like our Facebook page, share, and join us again. God bless you. All right. Well, it's so good to see all of you. And I know Pastor Lynn just got done reading the scripture. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we will dive into today's message together. Let us go and seek the Lord together. Merciful Father, Lord, we, we, we are so thankful again, Lord, to be gathered today for the great privilege of hearing you speak, Lord. I know that so often we, we love to come, we enjoy fellowship, but there is no greater fellowship than what we have with you, than what we have with your Son, and that what we have with your Spirit. And we want to worship our triune God as we listen to your voice today, as we hear and read your revelation to us, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the text before us, and I pray, Lord, uh, just because of the, uh, the mightiness, the power, the weight of the text before us today, that it, it deserves our attention, I pray, Lord, that it would grab us and that it would call us to see and reflect on the kind of character that is pleasing to your eyes. Help us, Lord. Help us to be men and women, brothers and sisters in your divine household. Help us, Lord, to be conformed to the image of Christ and to bear the type of character that is pleasing to you. Bless us, Father. We also pray for those who are not with us, Lord, and for those who are sick, Lord. We pray for their healing and that you would draw near to them in your covenant care and compassion and grace and mercy and that you would heal them, Lord, and that we would be reunited with those who are not here today. Bless our body today, Lord. Bless the text and the preaching of your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So good. Great to see all of you again. Well, the title of my sermon is, just like last week when we went over the portrait of Brother Timothy, is Epaphroditus, a faithful servant of Christ. So part two of portraits or the report that Paul is giving here, Epaphroditus, a faithful servant of Christ, and my sermon outline consists of three points, and what I want to look at is in verse 25 are Epaphroditus's titles, his titles or the honor that Paul gives him, and from verses 26 to 28, we want to look at Epaphroditus's sickness and then lastly, the last two verses, 29 through 30, we want to look at Epaphroditus' sacrifice. Well, we ended up last week studying Paul's report on Timothy, which included an apostolic recommendation and approval and his arrangement to send Timothy as soon as he could. And we find those plans, look in your Bibles, we find those plans in verses 23 to 24, where he says, Therefore I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me, and I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. So we see that Paul was hoping to send Timothy ahead of himself as soon as he had received an update concerning his present circumstances. But as we will see, the sinning of Epaphroditus now isn't dependent upon a future update. So Paul's plan was to send Epaphroditus immediately before Timothy and before Paul himself to present the letter before us to the church in Philippi. And the text gives us two reasons for why Paul is going to send Epaphroditus back to him. And the first reason for sending him back is in verse 26. The first reason he gives us is because he was longing for you all, is the first reason. And the second reason is in verse 28, that upon receiving Epaphroditus, the Philippians may rejoice, sending him so that they may rejoice, and that Paul saying, I may be less concerned about 
you, that I may be less concerned about you. Why is Epaphroditus in Rome? He's in Rome because while he was back in Philippi, the church was informed that Paul had been imprisoned, he had been enchained for the gospel. Epaphroditus, he was one who was qualified, he was one who was willing, and he was one who offered himself to go and make the trek, and it's an amazing trek. Some 700 miles if you're traveling by sea, 1,200 miles if you are going by land. It really was a journey uh, this trip that he was making really was a trip. And so he was, he was willing to make the trek, take the journey. He was willing to go and minister to Paul, to serve Paul, and to bring the gift to Paul. And for all we know, Epaphroditus also made this trip alone as well. And that definitely tells us something of Paul's need, that it was an urgent need, and of the Philippians' concern and especially of Epaphroditus' concern and love for Paul as well. And when you think about what he was willing to do to make this journey alone, uh, there really isn't a better picture of one's love for their leader or their fellow brother than what is being shown to us here in Epaphroditus' willingness and his desire to go and put his own life on the line to risk everything and regard his brother as more important than himself so that his brother would be okay, so that he would be taken care of and his needs met. And so when you think about the danger and the risk involved and making a trip for another's well-being, you can't help but think back and meditate on the words of the Lord Jesus Christ Remember back in John 15, verse 12, Jesus said to his disciples, this is my commandment. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. And then he said in verse 13, greater love has no one than this that one laid down his life for his friends. And what Paul demonstrates for us is that in Epaphroditus, he saw and we see a merely human and finite example of Christ's infinite humility. One who loved like Christ and he modeled Christ's selflessness. It really is remarkable as you, as you follow the flow of Epaphroditus' report from beginning to end, you'll notice a few parallels, for instance, that correspond to the Christ hymn that we covered just a couple of verses earlier. That there is a, for instance, there is a, a coming of a servant. There is the completion of a mission as well as a commendation in both of them. As Christ was sent, Epaphroditus was sent. As Christ was obedient unto death, Epaphroditus was obedient unto the brink of death. As a consequence of Christ's completed work, he was exalted and given the highest name. And as a consequence of Epaphroditus' completed service to Paul on behalf of the Philippians, he was warmly commended and highly esteemed. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? And that really, that leads us to the first point, verse 25. And this is Epaphroditus' titles, verse 25. It says there, but I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who was also your messenger and minister to my need. Now the word necessary in light of Timothy and Paul possibly being delayed, indicates that Epaphroditus was next and that he would be urgently sent in the meantime. And it's really interesting if you study this or look back on the meaning of the word Epaphroditus. Uh, this word, for instance, Epaphroditus, it, it appears only twice in the New Testament. It appears only in the book of Philippians. Though there is the mention of Epaphras, for instance, in other places such as Colossians and Philemon, which could be short for Epaphroditus, some think it's the same person. I do not think it is the same person, only because the difference in 
uh, the difference in the location of where they were. If you remember, Epaphroditus is in Europe. Epaphroditus is in Europe, and you have Epaphras and Colossae, which is in Asia. It's uh, two different countries that they are in. I don't think that they are the same person, though some uh, make that connection. But Epaphroditus, uh, interestingly, his name is derived from a Greek goddess named Aphrodite. And you can see that in his name. The Greek goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty and love. And in Rome, she was known as Venus. And this detail, something about his background, it further accentuates the Greek background and similarities that Timothy and Epaphroditus both shared by virtue of their Gentile or Greek culture uh, and cultural upbringing. Uh, if you remember, it was Timothy, whose mother was, a, whose mother was a Jew, but whose father was a Greek. And then you have Epaphroditus, who is named after a Greek goddess. Um, and it, it could have been the fact that Epaphroditus was from a family who worshipped that Greek goddess and named him after that. And so that would imply that Epaphroditus was saved from idol worship. Possibly saved from idol worship to worship the one true God in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But before he lays out the reasons of, of the necessity to send Epaphroditus, Paul very admirably, he highlights the type of qualities he encountered. What did he see in Epaphroditus when he was working with him? And Paul mentions five qualities, or what I have titled, five titles. Five titles that Paul finds or that he describes Epaphroditus using number one, brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, messenger, and minister. And so from a first point, I really want to just get into some of those terms and lay those out before us. But number one, Epaphroditus was his Adelphos. That's the Greek word for brother. And you don't want to miss the possessive personal pronoun that Paul employs, and he applies that one pronoun to each of those titles, to each of those descriptions concerning Epaphroditus, because he's not just a brother, he's my brother. He is my brother, which meant that he was a, a fellow believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was united to Paul in the deepest sense. He was a brother by adoption, into the same divine household, the family of God. They were sons in God's family. And that is the most unique, uh, that is the most intense, that is the most intimate re relationship that you and I can have toward each other, is to be sons, is to be a brother or sister in the divine household of God. A brotherhood existed between them wherein they both exercised love and a diehard commitment to one another. If you remember, uh, this, that kind of echoes 1 Peter 2.17, where Peter said, Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Love the brotherhood. Number two, Paul states that Epaphroditus was his sunergos, which meant that he was a fellow worker, he was a co-laborer, he was a, a sharer in the kingdom of God, someone who he wasn't afraid to pull up his spiritual sleeves and give it everything that they've got for Christ and the kingdom. And when Paul was with Epaphroditus, he didn't feel as if he was doing all the work alone. Isn't that a sad feeling? As some of you probably know, isn't that a sad feeling when the group is given a task and only one person takes responsibility for that task, Paul said, what I saw in him is that he was a co-laborer. He worked alongside me. And that really reminds us we are called to be fellow workers. We are called to be co-laborers in the gospel. And that means, brothers and sisters, that you and I have to stop giving our work away. 
We have to stop giving our work away. We have to stop expecting others to step up. We have to stop expecting others to pay for it or someone else to share the gospel or waiting for someone else to encourage one who is depressed or to bind the brokenhearted. We have to remember, we are, co- we are co-laborers and fellow workers in the gospel. You have to step up. You have to work hard and you have to labor. You have to labor. We have to help out. We all need to bear the burdens of the work that Christ has given the church to complete. The more members we have interested in the work, the more effective the church will be in the world. And it's amazing, even as you think of the book of Acts and you think about the number of members, we could say, in the early church, or who, who we are started with in Acts chapter 1, that there was 120 invested numbers, starting with 120, and as a consequence, as, as numbers and, and Christians are being added to the church, it says, as a consequence in the book of Acts, that they turned the world upside down. And further, all the work that we are to be engaged in, it falls under the umbrella of gospel koinonia, which is gospel fellowship. It's gospel partnership. Some of the things we've already mentioned as we've been studying the book of Philippians, what is, what is encompassed when we say gospel koinonia or gospel fellowship? It is this, praying for the gospel, how you can be a co-laborer in the gospel, praying for the gospel, suffering for the gospel, preaching the gospel, sending missionaries to spread the gospel, living consistently with the gospel which touches our godly witness and our conduct in the world, financially supporting the gospel, and planting gospel-centered churches who make gospel-centered disciples. That is what we want to do. Isn't that the work you want to be involved in? Planting gospel-centered churches who make gospel-centered disciples? We should want to be busy at work for Christ and the kingdom. And as Christians, we have the great privilege. It boggles my mind that we don't often do that we are that which we are undeserving to do. We have the privilege of of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the privilege of proclaiming him. We have the amazing honor of publishing his person and his crosswork and the massive responsibility of warning the world and sounding the alarm of the, sep- of the second coming and the capital D day of judgment. And we must proclaim it. That is among the things that God has given us, that Christ has given the church in her task. The two most important days for the Christian are the day of salvation and the day of judgment. And because we're saved, that means something radically different for us than for those who aren't saved. Yet, we ought to work hard and wholeheartedly because our works will be tried by the fire of perfect scrutiny on the last day. We should work hard. We should work with all of our hearts, mind, soul, and strength, not wasting our days, not wasting our time, not wasting our energy on that which will not profit. And number three, Epaphroditus was his sustratiotes, kind of a longer word, sustratiotes, which meant that he was a a fellow soldier and he was a fellow comrade in arms for the gospel and by virtue of their union with Christ, they were enrolled in the military service of God's almighty kingdom. That's how they saw it. We were soldiers and that is what we are. We are soldiers Uh, We are soldiers that it implies that we are at war and therefore we are going to experience the kinds of things that soldiers experience at war. We are going to experience sickness. We are going to experience suffering, affliction, opposition, persecution, desertion, much of which is consistent with the activity 
of Satan. First Peter 5, 8, it says this, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, it's your adversary, is your adversary, is our adversary, is the adversary of the church. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That is why Ephesians tells us because we are engaged in spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6 verse 11, put on the full armor of God. And he says we are to do that for this purpose so that you, brother and sister, you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle, he goes on, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to rest, to, uh, to resist in the evil day, and having done everything to stand firm. They fought in the Lord's army side by side. Number four, Epaphroditus was Paul's apostolos, or messenger from Philippi. And what some, some commentators have noted here even by using this word, by employing this term, is that in some sense, maybe it was out of admiration for Epaphroditus. Maybe it was out of admiration or out of respect. They have, Paul, maybe here he's raising Epaphroditus to a noble rank, maybe raising Epaphroditus to the ranks of some of the most respected and distinguished servants in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, the apostles themselves. Epaphroditus, you remember, he has to return this letter, and what do you think would be his reaction when Paul reads these titles to him? I think he might blush. I think, I think Epaphroditus might smile. Uh, that, he would, that this would bring joy to him of, of the Apostle Paul speaking so uh, admirably of him, so warmly of him as well. And although this term, it mostly refers to those who were uniquely commissioned by the Lord himself, in a couple of other passages, passages it carries a different meaning in that of a messenger. It carries the meaning of someone who is a messenger or an envoy as well. Someone who is an envoy, someone who is a a representative or an ambassador of another or a missionary who's been commissioned by the Lord. And, And that's also the distinction that we find here. There are those who have been commissioned in the church and those who have been commissioned by the Lord Jesus. Those who are, and so the authority determines the distinction that we make. The Lord Jesus commissions capital A apostles, and the church commissions lowercase a apostles or messengers or missionaries. And so the authority determines the distinction. And five, lastly, Epaphroditus was his liturgos. Liturgos, and that's the word that we derive the word liturgy from. Uh, It's the word that is described of the duty of priests, for instance, in the temple as servants. It's it's language that describes uh, those who are assisting or serving, those who are engaged in personal service to the Lord or to the church or to another. And that tells us a bit more about Brother Epaphroditus as well. The fact that he was sent for this task, at least implies that he had the support and approval of the church of Philippi. Though he may not have been an officer in the church, nonetheless, he had the quali- qualifications to be one. He had the qualifications to be one. He possessed the moral and spiritual qualities to be sent to serve, and to offer himself as a sacrifice on behalf of his sending church. And that's glorious. 
Paul says he was their messenger and minister to his need. And what was his need? And I think that his need was twofold. I think we'll bring this out a little bit in the rest of the sermon. But his need was twofold. To be sure, Epaphroditus was sent to deliver a financial gift to Paul. He was sent to deliver a financial gift, but it also seemed that he had intended to serve Paul longer. And the reason he's being sent back after dropped off the gift is because he was sick and because of the issues that arose out of the church in Philippi becoming concerned and uh, unaware of what had happened to Epaphroditus. But it seemed as if he wasn't there just to drop off the financial gift of the church, but also to send him back or also to serve Paul while he was there. And perhaps even indefinitely, we don't know if he, when he would have sent him back, but we know that he was staying there longer and was going to do more than just drop off the gift. But there really are, these are, these are glorious titles that Paul is giving, glorious honor to uh, Brother Epaphroditus. And that leads us to my next point in verse 26 through 28, and that is Epaphroditus' sickness. Epaphroditus' sickness, verse 26, Paul says, Because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. And this is the first reason that Paul thought it was necessary to send Epaphroditus back to the Philippians. In, in Epaphroditus, there was an emotional longing as well as an internal conflict within because his sending church was aware of his sick condition, that he had become ill. And so for some interpreters, or interpreters, interpretators, interpreters, they would take what's going on in the negative, that there is something wrong with Brother Epaphroditus, that he is homesick, for instance, or that he was succumbing to weakness. Maybe he wasn't, he wasn't out for the task. He was emotionally breaking down due to his sickness or to his condition or the, the pressure of life in the, in, the, in the ministry or as a missionary. But I think what is going on here is, is actually is very healthy what Epaphroditus is going through. And I don't think it is anything necessarily negative in terms of Epaphroditus failing to do what his sending church sent him to do because Paul says he completed the mission. He, at, at the end, at the last verse, he says he completed the mission. And, and, I, and, and the titles that we, were, that we just uh, unfolded, they dispel this maybe a negative connotation that some try to find here. But two things are important to see. Number one, his longing. Epaphroditus' longing, it is a natural and healthy consequence of making a long trip alone for a considerable length of time and being isolated from those who regularly care for your soul, that you would long for them. And his response to the Philippians is the same response that Paul has, where Paul said, for God is my witness, how I long. And that is not a, a hint or a, a, you know, a, a print of weakness of any sort. But, but Paul said, God is witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And the second thing to notice, number two, is his distress. He was in deep distress. The same word is used of Jesus' agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's important here to, to identify the source of his distress. What was the source of his distress? Notice that he wasn't distressed because of his sickness. He was not distressed because of his sickness. Epaphroditus wasn't worried about Epaphroditus. He was worried about his church. He was worried about the saints of Philippi. He's distressed because they're distressed. And that is amazing. And it's an example of maybe, even maybe there's been parents who you're sick and you aren't so much concerned about yourself. 
Maybe you're in the hospital and you're, you're really struggling with something. We had, we had that happen recently where we had multiple brothers and sisters in Christ in the hospital. Those in this church, outside of this church, COVID, sickness, everything happening. And their children coming to them and weeping. And, what's, and what are you most concerned about? Mothers and fathers, what are you most concerned about? The thing that distresses you is the distress of your children. And it isn't your own sickness. It isn't the thing which you are going through. But you, what, you, what you're most uh, worried about or concerned for are those who are concerned for you. And Paul is, in, and Epaphroditus is saying that his sending church is going through something like that for him. It was a deep grief. And at this point, uh, he very well could have been frustrated, frustrated with, with himself. He got a report that they were, they were distressed about him. And so you could imagine that maybe perhaps he was frustrated himself. The fact that he was in this predicament, that he was sick, that others were distressed because of it, that he was without strength. But it's important to know, up to this point, they don't know how it ended with Epaphroditus. They don't know how it ended. They don't know whether or not Epaphroditus actually pulled out of this sickness. And so do you think they'd be happy to see the face of one who they thought was going to die show up at their church? It really is amazing. You kind of go through the text and the report and you kind of press out all the details. And that is what Paul is informing them of the next verse. Verse 27, he says, For indeed he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. And so the church of Philippi, it wasn't without good reason for their distress, right? And how do you think that we would feel if we were to send another, a brother or a sister, we were to send a team of missionaries or church planters to go, and we heard that they were sick and that they were near death. That they were on the brink of death and we don't know whether or not, we don't know what happened to them. Such was the state of communication, of course. They were distressed. What would we be? We would be distressed. We would be imploring the Lord. We would be seeking him with tears and urgent supplication. And it was a beloved member from their body whom they had sent. He was on his deathbed on the mission field. In Paul's mind, he was so ill, we thought we were going to lose him. This is what he is communicating. And notice what Paul mentions, the word death here. He mentions it two times in this report. He mentions it in this verse, and he mentions it as well in the last verse and with reference to the work of Christ in the last verse. And he does this in order to echo the twofold mentioning of death in the Christ hymn, where it says that Christ, if you remember, he humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. And in the Greek, it just says, it doesn't say death, even death, but death, death on a cross. Death, death. And Paul's echoing that twofold mention of death. He's making this connection that Epaphroditus came close to death for the work of Christ, and that that is a shocking reflection of Christ's work for us. It's a striking reflection on the mind or of the mind of Christ. He was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him. Don't you love it when you see, but God? But God? I mean, good news always seems to follow from those words. But God. And in mercy, God had intervened in a near-death experience to heal and preserve the life of beloved Epaphroditus. And Paul gives all the glory to God. But God had mercy when he was dying. He gives all the glory to God, and he recognizes that God is the life sustainer. He is the life giver, and he is the life sustainer. Paul recounting the wonderful mercy of God. He wants to encourage and remind us that matters of life and death, beloved, matters of life and death, sickness and in health are not 
in your hands. They're not in your hands. They're in the hands of God. Life and death, sickness and health, we are completely dependent on God for those things. There is zero room to boast about how long you think you're going to be. You know, this, whatever it is that you're trying to pursue in order to outlive the world. But when you go, when you go, is dependent on Him. And further, Paul then reveals how the sovereign healing of his dear brother and co-laborer in the gospel, it wasn't an act of mercy on Epaphroditus alone, or an act of mercy that he alone benefited from, but Paul says God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. And so Paul, he admits he's already in a state of grief. Paul's already in a state of unhappiness. You remember, we say there's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness has to do with the state of your emotions, and it goes like this, up and down, up and down. But joy is, a, is, a, is something that was redemptively purchased for you to have. It never increases. It's immutable. It cannot be taken away. It doesn't diminish. Though our happiness is different. And that's what this word means, a state of sorrow, unhappiness, or grief. He's suffering a lot of spiritual and mental pain. And though Paul was always rejoicing, he's always commanding others to rejoice, he didn't deny and he doesn't tell us to deny the reality of many heart-wrenching sorrows that we will experience in this life that we will face. If one is sorrowing over sickness, brothers and sisters, if one is sorrowing over death, don't exhort them not to sorrow. Don't exhort them not to sorrow, but the Bible says sorrow with them. Sorrow with them. God's instruction to us, remind them of their joy. Remind them of their joy. God's instruction to us in Romans 12, 15 is to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And so we shouldn't tell them to get up from their sorrows, but you should get down. You should get down. You should get on your knees. And we should sorrow with them. In this life, true and eternal joy it is always attended. It is always accompanied by temporary sorrows. Temporary sorrows. They always go side by side. And it's so important to make the distinction between the joy that was purchased for us and the happiness or unhappiness we will continue to experience because of what we will face in this life. And so we want to rejoice with those who are rejoicing and we want to cry tears, we want to weep, and we want to sorrow with those who are sorrowing. And so, Paul doesn't tell us, he doesn't tell us the sorrow he's currently bearing, for instance, outside of almost losing his gospel partner. But we could speculate, based on what's been said, maybe it's his own imprisonment, he's he, he has been imprisoned for the gospel. Maybe it's the ill-motivated preachers trying to afflict him. You remember in Philippians 1, the ill-motivated preachers trying to afflict him while he's in prison. Maybe it's the agonizing churches, uh, the, the grief he has for all the churches that he has mentioned in other passages, and that would include the church of Philippi. And now Epaphroditus possibly succumbing to a fatal illness. But Paul's sorrows, they were relieved by the tender mercies of our God. And in this way, Paul was saved from suffering additional waves of sorrow upon sorrow. And in verse 28, he says, Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, that's what we're referring to, when you see him again, when your eyes behold his face, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned 
about you. So because Epaphroditus had been healed and God had shown mercy, Paul is eager. That word eager there means that he is now, he is focused. Is, is one of his top priorities is now is to send Epaphroditus back quickly, earnestly, zealously to send him for two reasons. Paul is expecting the sending of Epaphroditus back to his people, to his home church, to remedy two things that are mentioned here. Number one, their gladness, the gladness of his sending church and their joy at the reception and receiving their dear brother. Hansen, Walter Hansen, a commentator on the book of Philippians, brought this out when he says, only when they see, only when they see Epaphroditus and fully appreciate how God had mercy on him will they fully recover from the upsetting news of his illness and rejoice in the Lord over his miraculous healing. And number two, Sending Epaphroditus in good health, that would alleviate some of Paul's sorrow as well. Though it will not remove all of his sorrow, it will lessen his sorrows. And now moving to my last point, Epaphroditus' sacrifice. Epaphroditus' sacrifice, in, starting in verse 29, where Paul says, Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard. I mean, verse 29 really is the commendation for the sacrifice mentioned in the next verse. There is a kind, as we look at this verse, there is a kind of reception that is deserved by such men who go out for the sake of the name of Christ. There is a kind of reception that is deserved by that type of service. And some commentators have even stated that what is required here, what is he calling for? He's calling for a banquet. Receive him. He's, they're calling for an event where all the saints are gathered, the whole family of Jesus Christ, like a reunion where they are affectionately and warmly uh, welcoming and receiving men like Epaphroditus. Receive him. Have a banquet. Rejoice. Celebrate his homecoming and the fact that he completed the service that you sent him to do, and he risked his life to complete it. It was the furthest thing from a cold nod, what Paul is calling for here. The furthest thing from a quick pat on the back, it was to be the warmest welcome, it is to be the giving of deepest thanks, full of blissful joy, type of reaction, type of reception, from the church of Philippi. He was sent out by grace. He accomplished the mission. And Paul wants all the saints to be glad. He wants us to be glad. He wants us to celebrate, esteem these kinds of men with gratefulness of heart, honor them for their conduct, for their love, and for their service to the Lord. And that brings us to the last verse, verse 30. Paul says, do this. He says, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. And so this is Paul's concluding remark. And in this last remark, Paul leaves the best for last. And it is here where Paul demonstrates how Epaphroditus' sacrifice was parallel to and an example of Christ's ultimate sacrifice. The phrase mekri thanatu in the Greek, mekri thanatu, it means unto death. That exact phrase is carried over from the Christ hymn to the report of Epaphroditus. The only difference is the word angizo, which means close. Christ was obedient unto death, and Epaphroditus was near to death in the passage. And so when a missionary, and we just, even just to think about that, he came 
close to death. If you are thinking about being a missionary, if you're thinking about being a messenger or you have um, you have a, the, the, you are motivated to be a, mes- a messenger or a missionary or a church planter, these are things we have to think about. And this is the mindset we have to have when a missionary is sent and they leave home. They have to fully embrace the new reality that they are going to be exposed to things that they might not otherwise be exposed to. They're going to be exposed to different things, new things, and things that perhaps could be more dangerous for them to enter into. And Paul is saying that Epaphroditus entered into that risk, that he risked his very life to serve. He counted Christ and Paul, his fellow brother in the Lord, as more important than himself. And you cannot be a missionary if you don't do that. If you don't count the loss as more important than yourself. If you don't count Christ or the church more important than yourself. If you became a Christian, brothers and sisters, because you perceived it to be a me-centered, risk-free type of environment, you know, very safe, you are sorely mistaken. You are sorely mistaken because the Bible doesn't call us to cling to our lives or be obsessed with ourselves, but to die to ourselves. And it doesn't call us to love our lives. It calls us to hate our lives. Jesus said in Mark 8, 34, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever, wishes, wish, whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels, he will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul, which is more valuable than the whole world? And it should be obvious, beloved, that following the Lord Jesus Christ is not to be equated with a little cross around you, but you on a cross. You on a cross. Becoming a Christian because it dissolves whatever kind of trust you have in this world. You have been crucified to this world and becoming a Christian, it loosens whatever kind of grasp you have of your possessions, just as we saw. It's by giving up this world that you will gain the world to come. By dying, you will live and by humbling yourself to the lowest place, you will be exalted to the highest place and seated with the Most High and His Son. And what's more... He came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life. That Greek word for risk is parabalusamenos, which simply means to expose oneself to risk, to expose oneself to danger. And though the evidence is somewhat disputed historically how this word was used, some have suggested that this word was used as a gambler's term because it literally means to throw or cast aside, to throw, to risk, to throw or cast aside, or to put everything at stake at the turn of a dice. And some have said that he could have uh, gotten this word from, uh, from observing soldiers in Rome where he was in prison gambling and, makes an, and draws an analogy with what they were doing there. But in our context, your mind probably travels to uh, a game like poker or men who are, who are at, people who are, who, are, who, are, who are at a table and they are gambling. And you have the idea where they are gambling and they are pushing all their chips forward and they say, I'm all in. And essentially in terms of the service, mission, and heart of Epaphroditus, Paul is saying that he, Epaphroditus was not one who held his chips back with his life. 
But he was one who went all in for the sake of serving Paul in the work of Christ. And it wasn't as if Epaphroditus merely gave his time or only gave his finances or his energy to the cause. But he gave everything. He gave himself. He risked his own life and it didn't matter if the mission threatened his earthly existence or was the cause that sent him directly into the presence of God. Maybe earlier than expected. Come what may was his attitude. I'm all in. I'm all in. And as to the Philippians, also to us, the question is, brothers and sisters, is your life at risk? Is your life at risk? Is there any risk involved in your Christianity? Is there any risk involved? Or are you living safely? Are you striving for the pinnacle of safety or to be as safe and secure as you possibly can? That is not like Christ, is it? We must risk our lives. There must be risk in our Christianity. And lastly, the word for deficient, here that he says, he risked his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. That word deficient means something like lacking. That which was lacking. What the Philippians couldn't do because of the distance, because they were separated from Brother Paul, Epaphroditus has done for them. Where they were absent, He was present. He completed or he supplied what was lacking in the financial gift and his service to Brother Paul. And and because of that, Paul can say in the last chapter, in Philippians 4, 18, he says, But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent and what was that gift He says it was a fragrant aroma. It was an acceptable sacrifice. It was pleasing to God. He completed the mission. And he was faithful to the Lord and faithful to the Apostle Paul. And we should honor men like him. Highly esteem them, receive them, and encourage men to be like him. We need missionaries. We need evangelists, preachers who are not afraid to risk their lives and preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this portrait. Thank you, Lord, for this report that we have studied today and that we have sought to apply. And Father, I pray that, that this report, we would not allow it to pass us by, but that we would take the marks that were given to Brother Epaphroditus by Paul and seek to emulate those in our own lives. Help us to be what Paul titles Epaphroditus. Help us to emulate that which is pleasing in your eyes. Help us, Lord, to be a loving brother or sister, a fellow worker in the gospel, a fellow soldier. Help us, Lord, to be messengers, raise up missionaries to minister to the needs of the churches, the needs of the world, and the dire need of the lost. Bless us, Lord, in our endeavors, and we entrust your church to your care. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is Emilio Ramos, preaching pastor of Heritage Grace Community Church. We are so blessed that you've decided to join us, watch our sermons, and watch our content here at heritagegrace.com and on Facebook. Uh, Just please remember, our sermons are here to bless you, but they are certainly not here to replace the preaching and the teaching from your local church. Uh, With that, if you've liked the the material, the sermons, and the preaching here, be sure and like our Facebook page, share, and join us again. God bless you.